Hi, everyone. Welcome to AdAge Remotely. I'm Janine Poggi, Assistant Managing Editor here at AdAge. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you to our sponsor, Verizon Media, for making this live stream happen. Today, I am joined live by Adam Gerhart, who was elevated to global CEO of Mindshare back in December in the midst of the ad world grappling with the fallout of COVID and working to undo decades of systemic racism. He's here today to discuss the role of the media agency in a post-pandemic world and how Mindshare has been approaching so-called intentional media. Hi, Adam. Hey, Janine. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good. Thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. So before we get started, for those of you watching at home, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them on our social channels. We will try to get to them during this conversation. And if you like what we're doing here at AdAge Remotely, please like, share, and repost this, uh, this link and uh, keep the love going. So Adam, joining and being elevated to Global CEO in December with everything going on in the world, can you talk a little bit about what it's been like overseeing a global organization remotely. <laughs> um, suffice to say, it's been it's been trying at times. Um, the good news is it's been it's been easier to see people. Obviously, doing everything remotely and, and virtually, um, but obviously it's more difficult to connect with people. Um, and I think that's been one of the one of the biggest challenges is you know how do you how do you keep people um, engaged, motivated, and excited about where you're going when you can't connect with them in that in that kind of personal capacity that you once had. Um, but it's been it's been great so far, and it feels like we're we're headed in the right direction. What have you learned so far about like leadership? You know, during this time. Yeah, I, th I think for me, one of the one of the biggest things um, that's been kind of thrust into light in the last year, in particular, I would say, is um, th there's a great notion that Simon Sinek had, which is um, that being a leader today um, isn't about being in charge, it's about taking care of people in your charge. Um, and for me, that is um, incredibly profound and, and no more true than I would say at this moment, um, because the, the duty of care that we have and the responsibility that we have, not only to the brands that we support, but to our people and our staff um, and to our clients alike, um, is is not something we can take lightly. And, and for me, um, seeing the way in which the world has kind of responded and seeing the way the struggles and, and the trials and tribulations of our people has been one of the most challenging. And whether that's, you know, the social unrest in, in the US or whether that's what's happening right now in India with COVID, um, it's being there for our people and supporting our teams as best we can. Yeah, and, and obviously you have that global purview. What are you seeing, you know, internationally that perhaps you're applying here or, you know, trends that you are seeing, you know, across the globe? Yeah, so I, I think certainly from um, in terms of understanding the landscape and the way in which things like COVID are playing out, you know, we were we were arguably at the at the forefront of, of understanding the potential implication. Obviously, nobody could understand the, the gravity of the situation at the time, but we were in daily contact with with our teams in China, kind of on the ground, trying to understand what exactly they were going through, and and so we, to this day, you know, we were we were one of the first that put a global consumer survey into the marketplace before the WHO declared this a pandemic, before you know Trump declared it in a, a state of national emergency, um, where we can track consumer behavior and trends over time, and so. Hopefully that's that's helped us prepare in a number of ways, you know, around the world, just in terms of understanding consumer segmentation and their attitudes and, and changing behaviors, um, but also then applying that to um, how business needs to change. And, and you look at things like the compression of the, the purchase funnel and the rise of e-commerce. And hopefully those are things that we've been able to extract from from Asia and, and, and parts of the world that had to experience, you know, COVID first. Um, and apply it to our brands and clients that we represent in other parts of the world to help them um, see this through far um, further ahead of, of where they might have been otherwise. What are the trends that you are seeing now that you're paying attention to from um, a consumer I, standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly the, the big ones, as you would expect, everybody talks about the, um, the, the acceleration of the learning cycle that's happened over the last you know, couple of, uh, of months and how that's been compressed. I think um, certainly a, a greater appreciation of e-commerce. Um, you know, the pandemic accelerated e-commerce, but now we need to connect it. 
Um, and, and everything that we do right now is, is commerce to a certain extent. You look at Asia and the rise of social commerce, you look at um, live shopping events and those sorts of things um, where they're pretty mature in, in parts of Asia, they're still in their infancy in other parts of the world. And so we, there's, there's a lot of learnings that we can start to apply in terms of lasting consumer trends that we believe will start to be borne out in other parts of the world. Yeah, commerce is certainly an interesting one. What are you seeing as opportunities here in the U.S.? So I, I, I think, you know, beyond commerce being the obvious one, I think the, the biggest trend um, that we're seeing as we think about the evolution of, of our industry and the landscape that we play in is much broader. And that is that the idea of, of growth is being redefined. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, there's been the rise of, of kind of shareholder capitalism over stakeholder capitalism, which is which is great. But the last year has really shined a light on the fact that um, businesses um, more and more feel as though there's an obligation um, to not only drive business for their shareholders, but at the same time to do it in a responsible, sustainable, ethical and, and socially um, advantageous way. And so more and more, um, what we're seeing from a, from a U.S. perspective in particular, but it's playing out everywhere, um, is that growth is being redefined to what we call good growth. Um, any brand, any business can grow. They just have to discount, change promotion, pricing, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but in order to grow sustainably, we believe that you have to do it in a way that, that prioritizes growth for a business, not for the next day, not for the next quarter, but for the next year, for the next decade. Um, and the biggest way to do that is by um, doing it in a way that also takes into account changing expectations and demands of consumers. And more and more that's around DEI, sustainability, um, safety, all of those sorts of things. I definitely want to get into that a little bit later in in the conversation, but I'm I'm first wondering, you know, while in the U.S. things are certainly starting to feel better than you know this time last year, what are the things that are keeping you up at night? I think you know, in internally, certainly it's it's the well being of our people. Um, no no question, there's a huge amount of pressure on everybody. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that we've learned is is our people are incredibly resilient. Um, you know, we've been able to, to, to shift people around to work across geographies, across cities in, in the U.S. Um, but we also have people that are cross training and learning. You know, our, our, our admin support team are learning how to do financial reconciliation for media buys. And, and you know, the, the opportunities that, um, that once existed in a linear career path and trajectory are, are, are far wider than they once were. Um, so we're starting to see, you know, the resilience of our people play out. But I think... What's tied to that, though, is that you can't take anything for granted. Um, the need to over communicate, um, the need to bring people together um, is far more prominent. And you have to put a real effort into doing those, especially when you're moving at the breakneck speed that everyone is right now as we try and come out of this together. I'm here with Adam Gerhardt, Global CEO of Mindshare. Thank you to those who are watching at home. We have Angel from Puerto Rico, Lassie from Norway, Casey from Missouri, Tania from Pakistan, Max from Tennessee, Tana from Turkey, Gunnel from Canada, and Andrew also from Canada. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we actually have a question from Justin on LinkedIn. Curious, what character traits or values are you seeing emerge that you didn't expect from marketing leaders who need to make tough choices in shifting their business and how budgets are spent? Um, great question. I think there's there's two parts to it. You know, one is one is the interpersonal dynamics that are playing out from from kind of business leaders, um, and and everybody uses the word empathy. It's arguably one of the most um, overused words of the last year. Um, but but it's incredibly true. Um, you know, the best leaders right now are are ensuring that they prioritize their people and their teams as much as they are, um, you know, the, the, the viability of the business. Um, and I think that ties to the second part, which is, you know, what they are the, what they are trying to do is prioritize an ever growing amount of tensions within the business. Do you pri prioritize short term versus long term? Do you prioritize brand versus um, short term performance? Do you prioritize people over business? Um, but more and more, I think what we're starting to see is those are all interrelated um, and you can't decouple them any longer. I, I mentioned a little a little while ago the, the, the tension between shareholder and stakeholder capitalism. Um, and it's interesting, you know, one of one of our clients, Alan Jope, 
um, CEO of Unilever, uh, jokes that he actually gets angry these days when people ask him um, how he prioritizes the, the, the tension between doing good and good business. Um, because he sees those as inextricably linked. And I think for us, you know, some of the best marketers, some of the best brands right right now, especially in the US, are recognizing that those two things can't be decoupled because it, it is what consumers are expecting more and more. Well, sort of with this as the backdrop, and of course, what's happened over the past year, how has the role of the media agency changed and evolved? What is the role of a media agency, you know, moving forward? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, from a from a vision perspective, for us, it's certainly about good growth. It's helping our our clients be able to grow their business, but not just today, not just tomorrow, but for the next quarter, for the next year, for the next decade. Um, and and helping them do that is a matter of preparedness by understanding what consumers are doing, but also how their own business operates. And more and more, the conversations that we are having are pivoting from. Um, being about you know the effective number of GRPs impressions, whatever the case may be, to um, far more upstream consultative types of conversations. How should the client's organization be structured? What should they do in house versus what the agency should do? How should they operate geographically? Um, all of those sorts of things are are coming much more to the forefront of conversations. And so I would argue that the role of the media agency has become, um, much more diverse, um, much more broad as we help clients navigate some of these new tensions that didn't exist even a year ago. Yeah. Well, one of the new tensions that certainly brands have to navigate right now is the privacy crackdown. And, you know, this week, of yeah. course, we saw Apple's new privacy settings update roll out. How is Mindshare preparing for a cookie list future? What's the agency's, you know, data strategy and how are you ad advising clients on all of this? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, especially as um, everyone grapples with and, and races towards the, you know, the, the deprecation of cookies and that sort of thing. Um, we're, we're entering into a period of that we kind of refer to as the great reset, um, where people are, you know, racing towards, um, towards different solutions that might help them come to grips with things like the future of identity and what that actually looks like. Um, but more and more for us, there's there's countless ways to approach something as complex as identity. Um, but more and more, I think for us, the conversation that isn't being had isn't about um, what approach is right in terms of identity. It's it's actually about what's right for the consumer, what's right for the long term viability of the business. And by that, I mean things like um, privacy, trust, data ethics. Because regardless of your identity approach, you have to be taking into account all of those dynamics um, or, or else that identity approach very quickly becomes obsolete in a world where we're, we're faced with um, increasing regulatory pressure, um, you know, cookies going away and, and all of the other dynamics that, we're, that are compounding at the moment. Ron on LinkedIn asks, what new tech for the cookie list world are you currently testing in the U.S.? Um, I, I think it's, I would argue it's, it's probably less about technology and it's, it's more about different methodologies and different approaches. Again, I just referred to it a second ago. Um, there's tons of different ways that you can go about identity resolution um, or, or, or consumer learning, um, whether that's, you know, flock, whether that is cookie sinks, which arguably are, are, are going away very soon. Um, but instead, I think it's about um, incrementality testing to understand um, how we can design experiments and tests for our clients to understand both uplift in terms of sales, brand metrics, whatever the case is. Um, but also then very quickly being able to pivot the conversation back to um, those areas that I mentioned are, are kind of, I would argue, universal, regardless of technology, regardless of your approach to something like identity. Um, it is absolutely about understanding what consumers expect um, what they believe they've opted into or not, um, and how you ethically use the data that you have to engage them and, and support them. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and discuss Mindshare's diversity and inclusion efforts. But before we do that, we have a message from our sponsor, Verizon Media.
I'm Janine Poji here with Adam Gerhardt, Global CEO of Mindshare. Adam, what are your priorities around DE&I? You know, what has Mindshare been working on? And maybe you can give us an update on sort of what's been accomplished and what's next. Yeah, so I, obviously this is something that everybody's grappling with right now. We know our industry as a, as a whole isn't where it needs to be in terms of representativeness or composition. Um, for us, there's there's two ways that we're tackling it. The first is we obviously want to be more representative of the, the clients, the constituents, um, and the communities that we serve. Um, so our, our initiatives start all the way from leadership KPIs and, and representation, um, all the way through to um, tasking um, managers with uh, reassessing how they, um, how they recruit, how they retain, how they incentivize um, to make sure that we are bringing in a more diverse set of perspectives, but also um, backgrounds and, and um, uh, perspective. I think one of the one of the biggest ways that we're that we're doing this right now is is um, by helping to educate and inform our people. Um, there are things that we put in place like um, mandatory unconscious bias um, training um, and education for all employees, all levels. Um, there are other initiatives like creating safe room discussions with which help encourage um, open dialogue to identify what some of the barriers have been to to changing the composition of our industry. But I think, um, you know, in addition to what we're doing internally, one of the biggest things that we're doing that, that I'm really proud of um, is, is looking at how we can actually leverage the media investments that we, rep that we represent. And on behalf of our, our, our clients, you know, globally, that's almost $25 billion. We're looking at how we can leverage those to be a force for good and a force for change. Um, and so, you know, we were one of the first agencies to create um, a series of inclusion PMPs, which aim to directly um, siphon dollars um, from some of the um, some of the typical suspects and put those into the hands of, of underrepresented publishers or, or voices who have been suppressed. Um, whether that's the LGBTQ community, whether that is um, the black community. Um, and, and so those are the things that I'm getting really excited about because it not only changes the composition of our industry, um, but looks to redefine the role that we can play in changing the broader ecosystem in the world around us. Um, and so it's a combination of those two things that I would say are really coming to the forefront of, of our own DEI agenda. As we head into the upfronts where, you know, a bulk of ad commitments are made, is there any sort of goals or commitment levels that Mindshare as an agency is calling for from clients in order like to commit to minority owned media companies or diversity, you know, focused uh, media companies? Yeah, I, th I think it's it's less for us about a, a mandatory, um, but it is certainly about putting parameters in place and helping to educate people. In many ways, it's it's a journey that everybody in the entire ecosystem has to go on together. That's brands, that's suppliers, that's partners, that's agencies. Um, and so for us, it is about creating initiatives like Group M's New Majority Ready Initiative, which helps to, um, helps to educate clients and brands as to how prepared they are um, to actually communicate to um, and represent and serve um, different underrepresented groups. Um, and that looks at a number of different lenses. You know, do they have the right communications assets um, in the right language? Do they have people that are representative of the audiences that they're trying to talk to in those communications? Um, what is the media investment behind them? All of those sorts of things come into play. But if I'm honest, it means that we have to elevate the conversation beyond just being about investment to thinking much more holistically about representation. Um, and so those are some of the initiatives that we are putting in place to um, try and unlock those conversations across all facets of, of, of the ecosystem. And speaking of the upfronts, I'm curious if there's any um, media that excites you right now. What are you paying attention to, and uh, what's your outlook on the media space? So I, I think that there's there's a couple of different things that that excite me right now. First and foremost is is media's ability to actually do good in the world right now. Um, and I know that may sound generic, like a catch-all answer, but it's true. Um, we, we are at a, an interesting inflection point in our industry where not only does media have the scale, but it has the 
attention of consumers and the expectation of consumers to not only drive business, but to do good at the same time. Um, and so I think as, as the, the landscape starts to change, um, we need to lean into some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, in particular, you take something like the upfronts and you take something like, like the pivot to streaming. We are, I would say it's, it's less about the upfronts actually and more about accountability of investment. Um, you know, the, the networks are starting to prioritize streaming because arguably there's a greater degree of accountability in those areas where they can measure and track and understand consumers there. The exchange for consumers, though, is that they will be better served and better represented. And so for, for me, those areas represent really rich opportunity for us to start to think about um, not only how we create more accountable impressions and dollars and ad spend there, um, but the way in which we can better understand our consumers um, and what their expectations are to serve them. And so I think we are going to continue to see a, a, a pivot from you know, things like linear TV into streaming because um, because of the expectations that consumers have when they're in environments that are more personalized, more relevant, and the experience is a bit different to what they might have had in the past. What would you say are the biggest challenges for, for brands, you know, in media right now? And how are you guys navigating that? Yeah, I think we've 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 touched on it a little bit, but I think it's it's the 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 newfound um, dynamics that are starting to emerge, and some of the some of the tensions that are out there right now. The the short termism versus long termism, you know, the brand versus versus performance um, argument that's been out there for a little while. Um, but I think the other thing that that um, in many ways has been overlooked by by various facets of our industry um, is the fact that. Um, we talk a lot about the balance between accuracy and empathy. Um, accuracy um, has been, you know, at the forefront of conversations for, for the last year, I would say, in particular, um, as we talk about how we can more, um, uh, more acutely target, um, talk to, define, and understand consumers. It's about how people show up in digital data. But we've almost, to a certain extent, lost sight of the um, of the empathy side of things, understanding why consumers make the choices that they do, um, why they prioritize one brand over another, what intrinsically motivates them. And I think for me, one of the biggest um, areas of opportunity in our industry over the next couple of years is actually going to be how we rebalance those two um, and, and, and how we start to understand how we can accurately and, and acutely talk to consumers at the right time and at the right moment, which has always been what we've been about. But to marry that to the empathy side of understanding why people make decisions, how they make decisions, the neuroscience, if you will, of, of, of kind of choice. And more and more, that's what brands are expecting. Um, it's no longer just enough to talk to the right person. You have to talk to them at the right moment to understand how you can you know, make make just that little material, immaterial change in terms of copy, call to action, creative, um, you know, pricing um, change even um, to get them over the hurdle to try your brand and create more than just a sale, but to create a longer lasting um, type of relationship with them. And that balance is starting to come to the forefront, I would say, of of many of the conversations that we're having with clients, regardless of sector, regardless of of kind of brand challenge. I think to that point, you know, it's interesting over the last couple of years, as you've said, you know, we're focused a lot on like data and targeting audiences and all of that. But one thing we haven't talked a whole lot about is the actual content, like what yeah. what appeals to consumers. And while there's a lot of great content on various platforms, oftentimes we're not hearing anymore of like brands actively looking to buy specific shows or programs. It's much more about the audience. So it's just an interesting trend if, if you're seeing a, or start to see a rebalance of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I would I would say it's it's much the same. It's it's less about, you know, um, the, the sponsoring of a specific program or show or anything of the sort. But it is it is much more about the content itself and, and quite honestly, what that content represents. 
um, you know, some of the some of the work that we've been most proud of over the last year, um, again, is balancing both the accuracy and the empathy. Um, but it's also starting to balance the shareholder and the stakeholder capitalism or, or the good growth mentality, as we've been talking about. Um, and, and, and one of those um, that, you know, that we love to talk about is, is Unilever and Dove. Um, where they introduced the, the Crown Act, which um, aims to end hair discrimination. Um, it was something that Dove got behind um, in a pretty aggressive way. Um, it's been passed by um, seven different state legislative bodies now, and it's onto, um, onto the federal circuit for approval as well. And, and it's a really good example of actually how a brand can start to create content and conversation around something that is both good for business, but also changes the world around us. And I think that's the, that's the type of content we're seeing brands and clients lean into um, far more to make sure that they are not only driving their business, but they are doing so in a responsible, sustainable, and quite honestly, progressive way. So I, I want to shift gears a little bit as we, you know, see more people getting vaccinated and we look at plans for returning to the office. I'm curious what your, you know, outlook is and vision for the future of how we work. Obviously, a ton has changed over the course of the past year and a lot has um, been developed in terms of the ability to work remotely and all of that. What do you see, you know, moving forward of how the ad world will operate? Well, certainly, I, I think there's going to be a lot less travel than we've seen in, in years past. Um, maybe maybe not for me, given I've just taken a global role and haven't gotten out to the markets yet. Um, but I think um, the, the biggest notion that we're seeing right now is that of flexibility. Um, I think the, the expectation for people to be in the office five days a week is, is probably going to be challenged, you know, not only by employees, but also by the fact that we're finding we can be far more resilient, um, you know, and, and look at talent that exists in, in other markets or other, other geographies. Um, I think we're also going to be far more flexible in terms of um, the way in which we approach cross training. Um, we're going to be far more flexible in thinking about um, how our teams support other agencies within the WPP ecosystem. And I think, quite honestly, the aperture of, of um, our industry has changed immensely to the point where it's becoming much more about um, talent and less so about specific agencies or teams. And what that unlocks is the ability for our people to be much more fluid and dynamic in terms of how we think about deploying them as an asset um, and, and how they support the brands and the clients that they work with. We have a question from Michaela on LinkedIn. You mentioned a critical tool is to over communicate. How does that play out for you as an individual? How do you over communicate when attention spans are shortened and time is limited and there's a strong desire and there is a strong desire to limit unnecessary meetings? We are all struggling with the fatigue <laughs> of, of Zoom meetings and and uh, and teams. Um, I think I, I think it has to be done in a multitude of ways. You know, for for me personally, um, you know, my leadership team will tell you um, I we have two 15 minute stand up meetings a week. That's it. Um, and it's because attention spans are, are, are short. So we do 15 minute bursts, get across critical messages and then everybody kind of breaks. But compounding that or, or you know in conjunction with that i should say um we're also doing you know monthly monthly town halls we are doing weekly emails to our teams as well um and so it's a combination of different tactics um some things are are live some things are are virtual some things are via email um but it's also different lengths because of attention spans and exactly what you described um i wish i i wish i could say that i found the silver bullet but unfortunately um i think it is just offering um again that degree of flexibility um through a, a different array of formats and, and perspectives that people respond to because if they miss something in an email they might pick it up in a 15 minute meeting and just one final question you know as we think about hybrid models people may be working in the office several days a week home you know several days a week how are you looking to make sure there's an inclusivity like people don't feel like they're missing out when they're not on the in the office and everyone sort of stays on the same playing field i guess 
Yeah, that, I mean, that's arguably going to be one of the biggest challenges that not only we face, but but every business that's out there right now, um, because as we all pivot to, to remote or virtual or, or even hybrid, um, it's going to be about how we come together. And I think for us, it's about finding those moments of, of kind of um, introspection and inflection where we can come together. Um, and even if that isn't in a physical capacity, we need to make the time to do that because um, you know, going back to the point that, that we were talking about earlier, we are moving as, as an industry, but all industries, I would argue right now, um, at a breakneck speed. Um, and when that happens, if everybody isn't part of that journey, the the opportunity to drop balls or to miss something becomes that much more profound. So for us, it's about creating those moments. It's about different formats and different ways to, to bring everybody together. Great. Thanks, Adam. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Janine. Great to be here. Thank you to our sponsor, Verizon Media, for making this live stream happen. And as always, thank you to our Ad H crew, Alfred Mascaroni, Anna Sakula, and Max Sternlich for making this live stream happen. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in.